with the Butt Kicker Gamer 2, what you see and what you hear is what you feel. Butt Kicker, the future is feeling. Tonight, some of the top open wheel racers and racers on iRacing make their way to California and Japan as they get ready to start brand new campaigns for the Precision Racing League. Tonight, the IR04 series as well as the F3 series kick off here on Race Spot and VCO. Good evening, everyone. My name's Justin Prince. Alongside the move for tonight's action is Joey Tevin, along with our producer, Hugo Weez. As we take you into the broadcast booth, we are expecting an entertaining night. A new campaign for two different series gets underway starting this evening, Joey. And for many of these drivers, the pressure is on to perform at two very tricky circuits. The pressure is especially on in this IR04 series. This is a new series to the Precision Racing League last season. It's a new car on iRacing altogether. But this IR04 series was not broadcasted last season, so it was a little bit of an undercard to the F3 series. Now the drivers have been brought back up into the spotlight. Their champion has moved up to the F3 series. And now, just like in so many other series this week, it's it's a full field of drivers all looking to see who's going to be the new top dog in the IR04 series. And then, of course, I'm biased towards the F3 series. I love the PRL F3 series. I raced in it for the past three seasons. And now they're going to start trying to figure out what they can do without me. And of course, that was some adventurous moments, or some should say at least we've seen from you as well. But let's take a look at what tracks the adventures will take place for IR04 competition this season. We're at WeatherTech Raceway at Laguna Senca to start things off. Bob my Michelin Raceway Road Atlanta. Mount Panorama currently slotted for third. Interlagos Scuba Circuit, the 2000 layout, Gower Ring, Silverstone, Imola, Spa, and Suzuka on the calendar. A lot of Grand Prix style layouts, but plenty of adventurous different ones for the fixed setups that will be seen for these races 35 minutes up on the clock. It's a very interesting calendar. Like you said, Justin, there's the biggest tracks on Earth. The grade one F1 tracks with Spa, seven kilometers long. Bathurst is going to be crazy. We will be going there in two weeks. And then we go to Sakuba. The, the 2000 circuit is still... You know, it's a full-size track. It works for these F4 cars, but it's pretty small. And these are about the biggest cars, the fastest cars that you can actually race well there. So I'm looking forward to all 10 of these rounds. But the format of the IRO 4 series, we should talk you through this because this is the first time we are broadcasting this series. Like Justin said, fixed setup, maximum fuel 50% as, as is typical with these uh, PRL road series. Qualifying, 20 minutes of open qualifying currently going on right now in a 35-minute race. And then those tricky old usual uh, maximum incident penalties, those incident point penalties, 13x you to drive through, 17x you get disqualified. So be careful of those track limits and be extra careful if you're running into people. 
Worked out in 20 minute open qualifying has been underway for the past while and some drivers have already nearly reached some of those instant caps in the span of 20 minutes to give you perspective for tonight. But speaking of tonight, I'd like to take the time to remind you that this coverage is brought to you by CEO the Virtual Competition Organization. The series also brought to you by Advanced Sim Racing, owned and operated by passionate sim racers. Advanced Sim Racing designs and builds the sturdiest and most durable aluminum profile racing simulation cockpits available in the market today. PRL members also get a 5% discount on ASR products using the Precision 5 coupon code. Racebox offers mid and high end button boxes for sim racing enthusiasts, from the casual gamer up to the most meticulous sim racer. Competitively priced and carefully handcrafted, their button boxes are an enjoyable addition to any sim racing setup. Visit RaceBoxSimRacing.com and get a 5% discount using the Precision 5 coupon code. Race Lab helps you improve your driving skills. With modern overlays, race statistics, and native VR integration, you can get the best out of iRacing. Start using it now for free at RaceLab.app. Butt Kicker products include incredible immersion and bring realism to every game. Feel every nuance and truly put yourself in the driver's seat. And by Ninja Trader, ready to compete against the financial markets, supporting more than 60,000 users across the globe. Trader provides award-winning trading software and brokerage services. Trader is always free to use for advanced charting, back testing, and trade simulation. Visit NinjaTrader.com to get started with risk-free trade simulator and start tracking performance. Let's get the time now in to be able to track how things are going in qualifying as drivers are down to the final minute on the clock. 20 minutes of open qualifying, not including those having the time to finish their respective laps. 27 entrants have made their way out to WeatherTech Raceway of Laguna Seca to start off the season. Andrew Moran leads things off on the pylon currently for YS Motorsports Black. Of course, Minus Motorsports coming off a team title last season in the IR04 chassis. Keep in mind, you have Akabuizi, who is currently in second over Josh Conqueror. Currently, the separation about one tenth of a second or so amongst your top three. Yeah, YS Motorsports, Yellow Stripe Motorsports, a team that seemingly races in every single series in the Precision Racing League. I, I think they might actually race in every single night that we broadcast here on Race Spot. And Andrew Moran, of course, living up to their expectations, doing well on pole. Qualifying has just come to an end, so he's going to hang on to that. But Josh Conker, one of our NASCAR regulars, good to see him in the top three. And Hamilton Akabuizi as well. Strong start to the season, starting on the front row. Most drivers are already pulling off to the side. In fact, most drivers who have that extra bit of time, about a minute 45 seconds, if they wanted to complete their laps, not taking it. Corey Precker, who was second in the championship standings last season of note, not a good qualifying run, 14th in the session, a 122-1. That was his quickest time overall in the session. That one second is a major difference with a lot of the talent coming in and a lot of the expectations to start the season. And it's, to fi it's a fixed setup series, so understandably the gaps are going to be very, very close and Laguna Seca is tough. Laguna Seca only has one real good groove in this car in qualifying, so you basically have to nail it. You make one mistake and that's where, that's where those multiple tents are going to come from in qualifying. Mark Bruining won a race last season in this series. Tenth in qualifying. Again, not where he was expecting, not where Corey Precker behind him was expecting, but he's going to get one more shot at it because it is open qualifying. You get until your final lap, and is he able to improve? Unfortunately not. He's going to stay tenth. Couple 100 slower than his personal best. About 40 seconds to go. Drivers have a few moments until they get rolling. For tonight, starting grid, a lot to talk about for the brand new campaign. A lot of expectations just moments away from being met. Qualifying has come to a close. It's time to see how these drivers sort themselves out to start the season. Andrew Moran starts on the pole to begin the brand new campaign. 121 to 35. Second spot goes to Hamilton Akabuizi, along with Josh Conqueror and Davey and Cristelli. Your top four. Owen McLaughlin starts in fifth. Well, Kevin Santana's triple six starts in sixth. Galen Pavan starts in seventh. Well, Austin Harris will be in eighth. Zachary Hurt 
in ninth and as mentioned rounding rounding out the top 10 sean duemo starts in 11th matt Arjawalski starts in 12th michael blaze 13th with cody precker second place driver from the championship last season in 14th bob cohen and dave peterson the top 16. Tomer Gore starts in 17th with Evan Puckett in 18th. 19th goes to Samuel Ma. Starts in 20th. Kevin Burquist and David Hebert, 21st and 22nd with Thomas Coyle and Donald Olson. And rounding out your 27 entrants in Cabana, Adam Sands, and Jarrett Campbell. That's a look top to bottom at the running order. Drivers already making their way to the grid for the standing start. Waiting for the last few competitors real quick. Your keys to victory to start off the season. Keep it out of the sand or the dust rather. At Laguna Seca, mistakes are immediately punished. There's no runoff anywhere. Keep it out of the wall as well. These F4 cars, IRO4 cars rather, love to spin. They love to spin around under braking. They have less downforce than you'd expect. As always in the first round of a season in any series, the key to victory is simply surviving round one and bringing it to the finish. Third five minutes or 25 laps up on the board tonight. These competitors expected to be battling physically up at the front. Some of your top drivers in practice separated by just a few one hundredths of a second. But all the cars are just about ready to go. A brand new season for the Formula IRO4 is all set to go. We're underway for WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. Andrew Moran with a clean start, 3-1 as they make their way onto the Andretti hairpin for the first time in some groups. The battle for second, Conqueror tries to run the inside, clears on by, move the 54 to second early. And a clean start for your top runners. Already plenty of battling for about fifth or sixth on back from the starting blocks. McLaughlin has lost two spots already in the span of four corners. Here's those checkups. We always see him on lap one. It was clean and green through just about the first 10 drivers in this race. But you go back to Austin Harris now trying to fight up the hill here. Still straightforward stuff, clean stuff, and a great way, a perfect way to start this season. All 27 drivers that started this race are still pointing in the right direction and are still on track in this train right now. And one Sands didn't have the cleanest launches up the block, but they are still going. Everybody else with the corkscrew for the first time. And already McLaughlin playing aggressive defense in the 90. We've seen speed from that 90 machine for his PRL campaigns. Speaking of trouble, the last driver on the track, Jared Campbell, just spun around. Everybody else keeps it clean for the first time around. In the brand new season, the top five separated by 2.1 seconds to the flag stand. It's a great start by Andrew Moran. He's almost pulled a full second over Josh Conker. It looks like the fight's actually going to be more for second, at least for now, as Moran's going to try and streak away just a little bit. But let's ride on board with one of our new drivers this season, one of the youngest drivers this season, Hamilton Akabuizi. Strong in qualifying, out-qualified Josh Conker, got beaten on lap one, though. Now the switch around. Can he be a, as good of a driver on the offense here as he was in qualifying on his lonesome? It's always hard to pass at Laguna Seca. Trying to find that opportunity, you're basically just waiting for a mistake, unless you can absolutely maximize the exit here. Up the hill through turn six, coming up to the corkscrew. You can send it in there. We always see the most aggressive of Indy car drivers. They always love to make that move. And there's a spin in the background. I think that's Austin Harris. And some trouble. Christelli. That's, that's Cristelli, yes, in the 009, who is running up in the mid pack. Cristelli stuck along the side of the racetrack, drops the back down the Ray Hall straight. First major incident of the race from the heart of the pack. That's broken things up a little bit for your lead group. As you see one driver pick up a 1X. Owen McLaughlin dipping the tire off there in the exit of turn uh, nine or turn 10 rather. Again, so easy to do through there. You would think that in an open wheel car and he throws it off the road again and he almost spins it around into traffic. Owen McLaughlin is not having a very good time in the final couple of corners of this lap. He eventually recovers. And that's just one mistake multiplying into multiple more mistakes and he's going to fall to the back of the top 15 here long trendy racing machine having a mare of a moment speaking of moments here is Cristelli's moment right, right of the racetrack and into the concrete 
I'm surprised that car's still rolling. That was a hard hit into the inside wall, but tough IRO force here, apparently. Good job, uh, good job, iRacing, building these cars, because Cristelli seems to be going perfectly fine. I, I haven't seen him well, pull down pit road, or maybe he has. He has. He has. Yes. Okay, so false alarm. It looked good on the outside, but uh, concrete walls are still pretty hard. Speaking of troubles, Josh Conqueror from second has looped it. The private label team hype machine is off the track. Take him out of the equation. Let's take a look. That's not normally where you lose it through that corner. He lost it on entry. Normally, troubles through a turn six are stretching it out a little bit, taking a little bit too much speed, taking a little bit too much momentum to the outside and clipping the sand, David Cristelli style, but... He just lost it early, and he's going to fall out of the fight for the podium again. There was going to be a great battle between Akabuizi and Conker for the podium, and now it's going to be Josh Conker versus himself driving back through the field. We know he has the pace, but he's got 21 more laps to get back up into the top 10. Take a look at 12th. Let's take a look. And a bit of a squeeze. Big squeeze. Prekker's getting extremely squeezed here. That's uh, Dave Peterson on the outside. Mark Bruning is off at turn one as well. These cars are tough, especially on the opening laps on cold tires. And Andrew Moran is out from the lead as well. From the race lead, Moran with troubles. And the alarm bells are ringing for the 99 side as Moran looks to be back on track just about. May have been a tech sign. Yeah, that was a, a tech issue. We got scared, but that's no surprise. With, with what's been going on in these first laps, if that was legitimately a spin, I would have believed it. That's why I fell for it. But false alarm. If Andrew Moran's friends and family are watching, you know, false alarm. Calm down. He's still here. He's still got a two-second lead. Everything's okay. But everything's not okay for some of those other drivers. We have seen not calamity on lap one or on the first couple laps of this race. It's been clean. But these IRO4s are very finicky cars. These tires take a while to warm up, even at Laguna Seca. It's a hot track, lots of fast corners. You would think those tires would warm up quickly, but these things are, are almost made of stone. They take quite a while to heat up, and even when they are heated up, this car loves to spin. Ride right on board with Corey Precker here, one of our PRL regulars. Not quite as regular this season. I think he's a he's taken a couple series out of his busy schedule, but finished second in this championship last season. Just very, very consistent. His only DNF was in round one. So if he can keep that consistency up this season, it should be another solid year for Corey Precker. But we've got a spin in the background. Kevin Burquist for Crikey Esports, another driver who loves to cross the series in the Precision Racing League, but he has spun it around at the Andretti hairpin. Let's ride on board with them. And that is such an IRO4 moment. I can speak from personal experience. I don't drive this car all the time, but I was forced to learn this car for the uh, the race spot commentators race or the uh, iRacing commentators race altogether, I should say, a couple of days ago. And this car is so frustrating to drive because it just spins around when you end. There it is again. And it's Corey Precker and Owen McLaughlin. There's going to be a pile up at the bottom of the corkscrew. That's completely blind. Is everybody going to make it through? Magnon makes it through. McLaughlin finally disconnects, gets out of the way. Precker rather gets out of the way. McLaughlin gets going again. But that was a roadblock in the blindest spot on the track. How about that? Some of your top drivers from the series coming in, getting collected for meatball flags already as a result of the parking lot in one of the worst spots you can have it. The alarm bells were ringing earlier. They're definitely sounding now if you're spinning here. Yeah, Justin, I'm glad your apartment isn't burning down, but uh, Corey Precker's race has just burned down. And this is why you don't compliment drivers on race spot. I was complimenting him on his consistency last season. And then instantly he spins at the bottom of the corkscrew. I am, I'm just going to be a completely uh, unbiased commentator from now on. I'm just going to say a driver's name and not comment on whether they're consistent or whether they're a good driver or not. You're just a driver. I'm not going to curse anybody all season. That's going to be very difficult. Let's put it that way. It is. It's going to be difficult, but I'm, I'm committed to the safety of our drivers. By the way, take a look at a battle coming up to turn six to the Ray Hall straight. That's one of the advanced sim racing machines, the ESR Esports machine. And then moving forward up to 14th. Plus six so far. And currently battling with Donald Olsen, David Hibbert also keeping things clean. 
and close 23 seconds back of the race lead. Magnon had that really scary moment down at the bottom of the corkscrew, avoiding uh, Precker and McLaughlin as they were spun there. I thought he might have a little bit of damage. He might have clipped uh, either McLaughlin or Precker, either one of them at the bottom of the hill, but no, it looks completely fine. The front wing is as straight as it was at the start of tonight. And he's actually leaving Olsen and A. Bear in the dust a little bit here. So Magnon's going to chase forward with Josh Conker ahead of him. Conker's going to be looking forward because he knows he has more pace. It's going to be a lot of recovery drives through the field here because everybody's decided to make their mistakes on the opening laps when everybody's still packed together and you're gonna have to pass a couple of double digits of cars instead of if you made a mistake later on in the race you might only uh, lose a couple spots john Duhamel, meanwhile trying to hold on to about a one second or so buffer over zachary Dirt, along with peterson and puckett and just as I say that, nearly off the track, and that's how you lose your advantage nearly. Peterson now close. They pass by the floating pickup truck into the corkscrew. Zachary Yurt and the Zachary Dirt just a little bit, but we're riding on board with Evan Puckett in the back of this train. Sometimes this is the best place to be. We know Dave Peterson is a strong road course driver. How many road course series in the PRL have we seen him race in? An F3 and the GT3s and the Ferrari Challenge. Dave Peterson always a strong and consistent driver on the road courses here. So Evan Puckett, one of the Yellow Stripe Motorsports drivers, is kind of riding in the catbird seat here, watching Peterson, seeing if Yurt makes another mistake, seeing if Peterson dives it in too aggressively, and just kind of hanging back and, and hoping something happens. Train forming up amongst some of the air road. Speaking of trains, see some of that shuffling currently to building up. Behind them, Conqueror has passed Samuel Ma back for a spot. It's worth noting, you may notice up on the pylon, the lead is shrinking and fast because the youngster at 15 years old of the 107 close to the one second. Dive from the 53, meanwhile, a pocket. Hold on to the spot. Popping things up on the radio for a moment, but holding on for the position. Yeah, I thought Evan Puckett was just going to hang back there, wait a little bit, but no, Dave Peterson fell off the back of Yurt, actually. Yurt has pulled away at least a little bit on this lap, and Puckett saw the gap. He thought he would try and go for it. Didn't quite work out for him. Peterson was, was going to make him fight hard for that into turn five, and they didn't get into each other, but Puckett probably a little bit frustrated by the block by Peterson. It's understandable, though. You don't you don't necessarily want to be going side by side up the hill through turn five when you barely got a nose inside, but they all got it settled out, and the battle will continue as Michael Blaze is going to join the, the Spinners Club now. Plenty of loop-arounds and spin-arounds you can have in the Spinners Club. Pun very much intended as Blaze now falls back to 11th position. A dive to the inside. That is David Peterson. Move up eight spots now in the race. Let's take a look at how he joined the club. That's how. I mean, good on him for, for locking the brakes there, then pulls out of the way. It was a very interesting spin, and it's just so typical of this car. I'm going to keep saying that probably all season, every single time somebody has a lazy spin like that, because I have to defend these drivers, because I, I was one of them. Of course, I have to defend these mistakes, because this car is so difficult to drive. It's so difficult to figure out, especially on some of the fixed setups. Once you get the right springs on this thing, once you get them slightly less marshmallowy, this car is easy to drive, but unfortunately, this is a fixed series. These drivers are at the behest of the fixed setups provided by the simulator. So they've got a deal. If they're given those marshmallowy springs, if they're given the spinniest setup possible, they got to figure it out. And, and sometimes it's going to bite them and take them by surprise as it has some, so many drivers so far tonight. Yeah, the train's forming up off. No, one driver did go off of the corkscrew in Campbell, who was lapped down. We still keep an eye, though, on the train. Keep themselves tight and steady. That race lead, by the way, also down to half a second. So plenty of intrigue is starting to build up here around the facility in towards the midway point of this race here. And that's the major thing, right? Trying to plan out the strategy for the rest of the way to try and make sure you don't overcook and overexert the tires, right? Because the car gets quicker and quicker. It does get quicker and qu quicker and quicker. We see it in every single series. Those who know how to save the tires, those are always the drivers who are winning races in the precision racing league. Jarrett Campbell 
He's kind of struggling a little bit down the corkscrew there. I'm, I almost wonder if he's having some equipment troubles because that car did not look to be in control. That might have been a stuck throttle or something, but Philippe Magnan also got into trouble at the corkscrew. That can't be blamed on equipment. That is yet another IRO4 moment, but great save by Philippe, or it would have been a great save, and then he backed it into the wall a little bit too hard, but... Minimal damage and another spin. It's not going to be the last of them. I think Michael Blaze has just gone around again as well. Confirm that was off the track, but let's take a look at the race lead because I mentioned this moments ago. This interval now hanging around half a second. The 15 year old in that 107 car has closed the gap from two seconds to half a second. Closing this gap down. That's the uh, that's the easy part, or rather the Akabu easy part. Actually passing Andrew Moran is going to be the tougher part, especially at Laguna Seca. Akabu easy has been quicker. That last lap, he was only like seven thousandths of a second quicker, so that's not especially important, but the trend is very much in Akabu easy's favor right now in this first half of the race. He's been consistently quicker by four tenths on some laps, by two tenths on some other laps. No matter what, it averages out to Akabu easy getting a chance to pass Andrew Moran here. The question is, where do you make the move? Moran has been mistake free all night tonight. I shouldn't I shouldn't say that because that's just asking to curse him, but he's been very defensive. He's done a very good job of holding on to this position so far. But Cabo Easy has the pace advantage, and that is that's the ultimate pressure for a race leader. Cabo Easy looking a bit to the left and playing the defensive line, though, off to turn 11, coming up to start 14 laps to go this time by. This is the closest he has been since the opening lap of the race. Cabooese tries to squeeze down along the edge of the wall. The YS Motorsports machine holds on to the right side. In through Andretti hairpin. Cabooese makes it look easy to slice his way to the point. That was a fairly straightforward move. Andrew Moran was going full defense mode down the hill, and that frankly just slowed him up. That made Akabuizzi's job even easier. And now Moran's on offense, and he almost loses it. Incredible save by Andrew Moran to not wreck that car. But the first time he was in dirty air behind Akabuizzi, he kind of forgot how to drive turn three there. But what a save by Andrew Moran. We got to ride on board with that. Yeah, that was a major, major ride for the 99. And a look in a moment or so, that has grown the gap to two seconds through Cabooese's direction. Because of that, he had been losing a second a lap in some circumstances in the clean air compared to the 107. Let's take a look. This is what Moran saw. This is starting from the send up to the Andretti hairpin. A smart move there, just back out. You know Kabuizi's faster. You know he wants this lead. Just he's gonna take it, let him have it. But then the first time that Moran's in the dirty air, he takes a little bit too much speed, or probably takes a, the same amount of speed he normally would through turn three. But the dirty air forces him off the road. For some other drivers in this race, that would have been a lost car and a destroyed car in the concrete wall on the inside. But a great drive, great car control by Andrew Moran there to save that, keep it pointing straight. Now he's got two seconds up the road to catch back up to Akabuizi. If Akabuizi's used up his stuff here in the first half of this race, if those tires start to fall off in 12 laps time, Moran might have a shot, but at least in the first half of this race, it's very much advantage Akabuizi. Meanwhile, that's what happened to Blaze. Yeah, that was more than an off. That was a push off. Yeah, that was a little bit of a punt by uh, Josh Conker there, who's very aggressive. He's trying to drive his way through the field. He says he should be on the podium. It wasn't intentional, but differences in braking distances, especially at the corkscrew, which is in all of racing, in all of road course racing, that's probably the, the corner that differs in terms of brake distances between drivers. Conker sends it to the inside of Yurt. He is not being very patient right now, and you can't blame him. Time is running out. We're already halfway through the race. He wants to get back to the podium, but he's going for some low percentage moves because he desperately wants to get by Yurt. Meanwhile, troubles for Harris. Harris is off, right to the end of the course crew. Perfect view as everyone exits, and he has Beach. beached it. Yes, right to the bottom of the chassis. Doing his best Joseph Newgarden impression a little bit further up the hill. He was locked up all the way into the corner. He that that car. I think every single uh, tire locked up on on the entry to that corner there. And eventually it did spin around. And that's just the worst luck to get the car beached there. 
you don't normally get the car beached between the track and the sand, or the dirt, rather, I believe. If I'm being scientifically, geologically correct, this isn't sand at Laguna Seca. I think it's dirt that's just very, very dried out, but I don't know. Evan Puckett's on pit road, and he's the first driver to legitimately come down pit road. So looks like a scheduled one halfway through the race, just past it, in fact. So Evan Puckett, a 5.1 second stop. I'm Ian Cabana, who was towards the back of the pack, had a four second stop a while ago as well. Zachary Zurt has just picked up a black flag from the top eight, though. That's the 84 car. So now that means penalty serve time for incidents. The first black flag of the season for incident points. He's got to be careful for the rest of the night. If he's hit 13x already, he's still got he's still got 11 more laps to run. He's only got 4x to play with. If he makes contact with another driver, he's getting sent home. Zachary Year is so he's gonna he's gonna do this drive through with which is enough of a penalty in and of itself. He's gonna be on pit road for for 35, 30 seconds, something like that. Let's watch Thomas Coyle though while Zachary Year serves his penalty. And IRO4 goes around, almost. That was a great save by Thomas Coyle. He predicted what was happening. He locked the brakes, and that was a solid save. Got to keep it moving without any contact from anyone closing in. Go back. Where's this way we go as Peterson nearly says hello to the rear wing for a moment. I need a little bit of pressure in the line as there goes one of the cards for the pit lane that's Austin Harris from the toe. The send for Conqueror. Now looking for the seventh spot. Trying to shuffle forward. Of note, Santana has lost time. That won't close the margin to the fourth and fifth place cards up a bit for this group. Santana was on the podium, so that's disappointing for him. Conquer is just sending it on every single corner he gets the chance. It is going to work on Dave Peterson this time. He's going to be able to split the two teammates, or no, he's not. He has to back out of it. The VHR teammates of Peterson and Duhamel were racing, but now they've got to worry about Conquer, and I think Peterson sees the writing on the wall. If Conquer's going to be sending it like that, I might as well just back out, let him go, make sure not to hit him oh. in the hairpin. Who was that? Ooh. I think that was Campbell again. I think he's I think he's on Struggle Street in the corkscrew tonight. Yeah, that was Jarek Campbell who just took the hard left. The leaders are coming in a pit. The eight has just beached themselves. Boy, oh boy, how has it been intriguing to say the least to start the season? It's pit party time in all seriousness now. It is, of course. 50% fuel in this series. Drivers aren't going to take tires. You don't need to take tires in this short of a race. But this is what happened to Kevin Santana. Not always a driver that you expect to make mistakes. In the F3, he was always formidable. But in the F4 car tonight, it seems like it has been a struggle for every single driver in the field tonight. And if you're Kevin Santana, you can't even escape the mysterious spinniness of this IRO4 car. But he's going to fight back. I think he might have the pace to catch Povan before the end of this race. So he had about a four second gap before he came into the pits. I think Santana has had the pace over Povan tonight. So we, we could still have a battle for third. He's just, just got to make sure he doesn't spin again. Some tight calls coming out of the pit lane. Evan Puckett nearly bit of contact there. And while behind him, lines up duo now with Dave Peterson. Puckett going for a two lap undercut compared to his competitors. That's picked up at least a couple spots to the 617 and the 35 of the call. Puckett's going to be in trouble here because he's got Burquist ahead of him, and Burquist is going to hold him up just a little bit here. The undercut oh, in this series, him. did he hit him or did he spin or did they? I think they both got away with it, but Sean Duhamel is going to take advantage of both of them getting slowed down there. He's going to get the two for one special over the top of the hill. Puckett's going to get it slowed down for the corkscrew, though. But that was a scary moment for Puckett. He got away with it. But he almost took Kevin Burkwist with him. I'm gonna hold on. By the way, the comment from Campbell after the troubles of the corkscrew. Thanks. Well, it went that same, but it may. Do him looking to try and close back up to Puckett, and it's been an adventurous day for a couple moments for that 53. Keep in mind, Peterson, who was in this pack third in last season's championship standings. Puckett's got his sights set forward now. Oh, he almost throws it off the road in the background. That's actually Duhamel that almost throws it off the road. Now there's the teammate battle again for VHR. Peterson and Duhamel. Peterson's going to go for the switch back here through turn three, but he has to back out of it. Would have been driving 
directly into the right rear of his teammate if he didn't back out of that. But that was a great opportunity to switch back. Didn't quite work out for him. And also our leader, Hamilton Cabuizzi, finally elects to bring it to pit road, as does Povan. This should be the end of the pit cycle for every driver in the field. Pit limiter in full effect for the 107 as they roll to the stall. Going a good two laps further than Andrew Moran. That means a quicker stop with less fuel in the tank, 4.3 seconds. And also stopping, also taking a little longer stop, a little insurance fuel at five seconds. Only Josh Cocker is yet to duck down to the pit lane. Moran several seconds back of the 107. I'm pretty surprised that Josh Conker is able to go an extra lap. Even even our leader, Hamilton Akabuizzi, I think went as long as humanly possible because he had no reason to do anything other than that. There's a lap car spun in the middle of the road. That's Thomas Coyle again doing the Thomas Coyle special by locking the brakes and saving the car. And Austin Harris was in trouble as well. But the undercut doesn't really work in the F4 and the F3 series because there's no tire changes. You're on the same tires from lap one to the end of the race, unless there's a, a really weird race where the track is like 9,000 degrees and the tires actually fall off within 40 minutes. But the only way the undercut works is if the driver ahead of you gets stuck in traffic and Akabuizzi had no traffic whatsoever. So Moran's going to stay about seven seconds behind. And on a swap, one of the VHR racing machines swapping on by behind in turn Peterson in front this intense spot time B separating things out for this respective group Conqueror has come in this time he made it 18 laps coming to seven to go so the 54 cycle back around also making it that mark Elite Rajnan along with David Hibbert who are seventh and eighth on the racetrack and your current biggest movers that also changing them with stops expected for them. I'm interested to see the blend here on Josh Conker. He was racing with Peterson and Duhamel and Puckett when he came in, but they were all fighting with each other previously. They were all slowing each other down, but Conker might actually be able, he is going to rejoin easily in the top six here. Conker's recovery drive, a top five still might be on. He's only come out half a second behind Rizduski. He's only five seconds behind Santana. The podium's probably out of reach with Povan about 13, 12 seconds up the road, but top five for Conk, that'd be a solid recovery. You need to be careful. There is a lap car slow. Campbell yet again. His roller coaster continues. He's been able to find his way back onto the track. Just out of the way of the leader, seven seconds, although a bit of a clip of the groups and in the dirt. Looking around for a moment. So things calm down. Josh Conqueror has cycled to sixth worth noting into a battle for fifth, in fact, as a result of the pace he showcased after his mistake earlier. So several different groups started to form up smaller packs compared to what we've seen earlier. And Conqueror's now all over the back of Rydzewski. We ride on or we ride on board with the driver behind Conqueror, I believe now. No, we're riding on board with no. Yurt, rather. I, I'm still getting used to all the new liveries in the F4 series this season. But Yurt's chasing down at David A. Bear, who has a, a similar livery to Josh Conker, actually. Oh, big slide by Zachary Yurt. Good save. You don't normally see drivers save it when that happens. And here's Conker getting by Rydzewski straightforwardly. Look easy up the left side of the track. Conqueror, for somebody new to the series, has taken to this car fairly well outside the cold tires, I've noticed. And outside, of course, punting via contact. Josh Conker's always been strong on road courses, even though he's one of our NASCAR competitors. Every time we go to a road course in the truck series or in the cup series, last season he won the season opener of the uh, PRL NASCAR Cup Series at Sonoma. Abner Acosta, who normally dominates the road courses, was out for the night, but Conker picked up the pieces. He ran away with it. He had a dominant performance. He knows how to drive road course cars, and... He's proving tonight that even though this car might be about a, a third or a quarter of the weight of a NASCAR next-gen car, he still knows how to drive it around a road course. I mean, when it comes to private label team hype, right? They like to put every single one of their cars into victory lane, no matter the series. Seen it throughout the time. By the way, we've had a disqualification, the 84. Or is done for the night. He's reached the incident limit. The first one to get that on. 
first one to get that honor. I feel bad for you, Zachary Yurt, but get that out of the way early on in the season. I know I've been disqualified from, I think, multiple PRL races for reaching the 17X limit. So it's a it's a it's a rite of passage and you, it's going to happen eventually, especially at Laguna Seca, where those one X's are just waiting for you as you extend the track a little bit. But there's nine more races to go. And luckily, when we get to Bathurst in two weeks, you're not getting off tracks there and off track at Bathurst is just the end of your race. Yeah, it's the wall. Exactly. Oh, cranky. Oh, cranky could be the main call in reference to the car we were just following along with from Cranky Esports. Meanwhile, looking up, making their way for seventh and eighth positions, looking towards Pocket Peterson. Peterson is closing in quickly. Seven tenths gain last time by. Now within the draft, looking to get the fishing rods out. It looks pretty strong under braking through the corkscrew. He locks it up just a little bit coming down the hill. I think that might have just been dragging a little bit in, in the last part of the corner. They're going to reach a lapped car here. I think that might be that might be Campbell, but he's going to throw it off the road and get out of the way. So well done by him. Completely open up the road for the leaders. You don't need to be on track. You can just give them the whole the whole road. He's going to get back on and uh, hopefully he doesn't get disqualified. He's in a few spins tonight. He might be up in the uh, up north in the incident points, but He's only got three more laps to make it to the end. I, I wish him well. I wish Dave Peterson well too, because I want to see a, I want to see a battle here for seventh. These two have been strong. They've been aggressive, and I want to see them meet each other before the end of this race. I think everybody does. Under five laps to go, by the way. Under four, actually, with how quick this has gone for some drivers in the 120s all throughout the race. And keep in mind, Peterson, we've seen, is somebody that can get these moves done. The consistency from him came up, especially in the middle portion of the last season in the IRO for Chelsea. So far tonight, picking up solid positions in what can you say? Consistency wins you championships. Consistency does win you championships. I'm, I'm sure he's going to be disappointed even if he does make it up to seventh because that seventh place this is don't win you championships necessarily but when you've had a day like we've had today at laguna sega when we're getting the race one jitters out of the way we're getting the iro four jitters out of the way to finish this race in the top 10 is certainly an accomplishment and to not have to use this race as your one drop week you can afford to have a worse week that is a very good thing if you want to be one of those drivers competing for the championship for the top three even just the top five dave peterson He's accomplished his, his main accomplishment for tonight, which is stay on the track. And there's likely in that range to have to use one. Browning, we talked about, expected him to be quick tonight. Well, the early trouble cracker had the parking lot. Those drivers 26, 25th respectively. So far, Laura Peterson, and you can hear how the car bottoms out around the racetrack. Still, Peterson the turn to close up this gap the way things are faring out here the matter of the fact though is this is where the chess match comes into play right and he's running out of time to make this move and he's also just kind of annoyingly not quite quick enough to catch up to Puckett to actually make the move when you're when you're chasing a driver like this it is very annoying when the driver in front of you is running exactly the same pace as you you're thinking if I could just get you know, like two tenths closer, like one tenth closer. I can actually be in the draft. I could actually go for a move, but no, he's just stretching it out a little bit, but there's a lap car here down the hill and Puckett's oh. going to spin behind. I believe that's Michael Blaze in the Coke car and Puckett goes around. That was Cabana in fact, and that will lose Puckett some valuable points towards the end of this one. Why is Motorsports Gold Machine able to keep going with the spin around? Down to the final two laps to go. Not what he'd want to see, though. He got out of his rhythm. He had to check up more because Cabana was in front of him. And the brakes are so finicky on this car. We've gone about 20 laps without talking about it. We thought everybody figured it out. But then you get that extra stimulus, that extra unexpected thing in front of you. And suddenly the car is not as comfortable as it once was. And it goes around. Luckily, we're in the, the late stages of the race. Everybody's kind of spread out. He's only going to lose two spots, so he's still going to have a P10 run going, but that is that is disappointing for Puckett. I'm sure he felt very comfortable ahead of Peterson. He was running good laps, but one mistake. It's going to drop him down to ninth. Right from a Samuel Ma in turn, but the white flag waving up of the stand. 
Boise. Able to pull away by 10 seconds in the second stint of the race. And the youngster looking to close it out strong as they reach the 35th minute up towards the clock as well. I think Andrew Moran in second is actually backing down just a little bit. I, I think he might be near the incident limit. And he's just trying to bring this car home without a penalty. So the gap between Akabu Easy and Moran has expanded just a little bit artificially, but also it, it kind of hasn't. Akabu Easy has been dominant tonight. He's been unbeatable. He passed Moran on track cleanly. And he, and he never looked back. I was thinking maybe the tires would fall off at the end of the race. Maybe Moran was saving a little bit. Nope, Akabo Easy's just dunking on the field here at Laguna Seca. And that's how you start a season. That's how you put fear in your eyes of your competitors for the next nine races. That's how you establish yourself as the first real championship contender. The Unster from New Jersey started racing just six months ago on the platform. Loves to race and loves to game in his free time. He mentioned he didn't have a job as he is young at 15. But tonight, he did put in some work. He put in plenty of work. He put in a victory drive. He wins the opening race of the season in the IR04 for the Precision Racing League, powered by VCO. Andrew Moran coming across the line second, then third, fourth, could swap around. Here comes Santana inside, outside, Conqueror, the switchback, Conqueror gets squished by Santana, Conqueror recovers to a fourth place finish over the triple six. Let's, uh, let's get a clip of that switchback and let's put it on Sim Racing Wiki under switchback because that was, that was perfect by Josh Conqueror. That was incredible. A driver with Kevin Santana's experience, even he can't pull back a, a switchback like that. That was incredible by Josh Conker and well recovered by him to end up in fourth by the end of this race. I said a Easy was the first real championship contender, but if Josh Conker didn't have that setback tonight, I think he might have also been in conversation for this victory. So that bodes well for the next nine weeks. We've got a lot of strong drivers in this field. We're in for quite a championship battle, even without our champion from last season, Ethan Tavitas in the field. Meanwhile, in one of the final battles, Donald Olson holds up to 11th over David Hebert. Bob Cohen, the last driver to finish on the racetrack here tonight. With that, checker flag waving across the circuit. An eventful one, to say the very least. Let's take a look at how things played out in your unofficial race results. Akabu Easy. Puts up the victory by 11 seconds over Andrew Moran. And Pat Ben finishes in third. Conqueror, Santana, the top five. Bartolowski finishes in six. Peterson, Duomo, Puckett, and Moth, your top 10 on the racetrack. Olsen, Hibbert, Cohen, Berquist, and Blaze, the top 15. Don't lead out and close out your lead lap competitors. And in 16th, Thomas Coyle. In 17th, Cabana, Gore, and Harris, the top. 20. 21st goes once again to Sands with your 12th Cation ending his day five laps early, 22nd. Jared Campbell survived to make it to the 10th position. McLaughlin, Frecker, Burning, and Cristelli rounding out the 27 entries. Conquer did get the fastest lap up on the board. And for those who may have noticed, there was a switch because it Looks like a black flag for Conqueror. Up in that final lap, he had 13 incident points at the time of the checkered flag. That is so disappointing for Josh Conquer after that drive forward. He, he basically finished, I think, where he he fell down on the uh, on the initial incident. So that's that 13 X. We've seen that so many times. It bites right at the end of the race and it hurts so much more when it comes after the flag like that. I don't even know where the extra incident point could have come from. Maybe it was a phantom 4X from how close he got to Santana, but I don't know. I know he's going to be disappointed for sure, though. Post race coverage just about to get underway here. Plenty of drivers anxious to speak with us after an eventful run here in M or rather IR. Oh, for competition. Plenty to discuss amongst those drivers. Why don't we head towards those drivers if we can, in fact, as amongst those is your race winner tonight. Hamilton 
Akabo Easy now joining us here with the broadcast booth. The youngster comes away with the victory to start off the season. You put in work tonight to win race one. How are you feeling? Uh, really awesome. Yeah, it was a great race, tons of fun. But I think I think some of them were faster than me. I was just more consistent. Like I was like a tenth away from my best every lap. So yeah. Talk us through that build back to get back up to Moran because you were two seconds back to start. Started to chip away, chip away. Talk us through that process to close up the race lead to take that back. I mean, just hitting my marks every lap, trying to not make mistakes, which he made a couple. And that eventually allowed me, when I got past, he immediately dropped back. So just staying consistent. It's already putting you in the conversation for the early portions of this championship. How do you plan to approach things now, knowing you've already picked up some value points to start off the season? What do you plan to do to build on? Try not to get overconfident and just keep doing what I am. Well, thank you very much for the time, Hamilton. Congratulations on your first victory of the season. Thank you. Hamilton Akabuizi picks up the victory tonight here from WeatherTech Raceway of Laguna Seca. Second spot tonight went to Andrew Moran on the racetrack. Andrew is also now standing by. He will be with Joey. Joey. Hello, well, and hello Andrew Moran. Welcome to Race Spot for the first time. Looked like Hamilton. He was just, he was uncatchable tonight. He had the speed. What more did you need to, to keep up that battle with him? I, uh, I don't know, man. It's, uh, I just didn't have the race pace. I, I didn't even, I didn't even use my last couple of minutes in qualifying. I just didn't have the pace in the race. I don't know. He was faster than me about half a tenth, felt like half a second every lap. Seemed like it was a difficult race tonight. I think we saw probably about half the field have a spin at, at some point. What makes this car so difficult? This IRO4 car, it's it's deceptively difficult. I tried to explain that all night tonight on the broadcast, but I think from a driver's perspective, you could probably explain it better. You know, uh, it, it's just, it is, it's super light. I mean, you get in like, uh, you get in the F1 car, like the Mercedes, and it's, it just takes turns so easily in comparison, has so much more grip. This has less grip, less weight, just feels like, at any moment, it could it could slide away from you. But you know, it's really the track is why everybody spun the night. I mean, Laguna Seca is uh, up and down elevation, and it's it's one of the most grueling drivers tracks for sure. So I'm I'm not surprised. I'm sure we'll talk more about this at the at the post race of next week. But Bathurst is coming up in two weeks. That's been a big that's been a big pin on the calendar. We've all been mentioning it. You said Laguna Seca was grueling. First of all, will you be here on the grid for Bathurst? And if you are, uh, how terrified are you of it? You know, I'm not. I take it. I take it one week at a time, and you know, nothing. Nothing's really that scary for me. I, I dial it back. Like, if if we got a we got a track like that, and I, I just like to finish the race. And you know, if Hamilton had made a mistake, I would have capitalized. I just didn't have the pace, and that's what I'll do next time. Andrew Moran, bookmark that. Not scared of Bathurst. That's going to scare all of your competitors. But before we let you go, the first night night of the season, first broadcast for this IRO4 series, who do you got to thank of that Yellow Stripe Motorsports squad? Uh, you know, everybody, they just took me in kind of last minute. Uh, this is my first race in, in, a, in a league, actually, for, for iRacing. And, uh, I love it. This is like, this is, this is awesome. Super cool. It is indeed awesome, and I'm glad you've caught the lead bug. Congratulations on your P2 tonight, and we'll see you for the rest of the season. Thank you. Andrew Moran, interviewed for the first time on a broadcast, but it looks like we've got one more driver waiting. Justin, uh, Corey Precker did not finish the race, but he was second place in last year's championship, and I'm sure we'll be seeing more of him in, up in the upcoming weeks. And not looking too pleased after that run, Corey. Talk us through what happened as things fell apart I've been uh, very busy over the last couple weeks uh, just busy with life stuff um, 
but I haven't had too much practice. But anyways, what happened was is that uh, just basically spun at uh, the corkscrew, and uh, Owen McLaughlin McLaughlin uh, ended up uh, hitting me. He had no uh, chance to react whatsoever, and I, I apologize to Owen. Um, nothing he could do, and unfortunately it knocked my uh, rear uh, right tire, and it um, and. And it just came up as uh, too much damage were done on iRacing, so uh, I couldn't continue the race. Of course, big hit to the championship points, at least for the drop side, potentially early on. Now, now it's going to be difficult that you'd have to think for the build back up. So now, what's that focus and drive going to have to be like to be able to battle back, to be able to recover early on? Especially knowing how well you did in the championship last year. Uh, yeah, I just think I think I just gotta get practicing more often. Uh, this is my first race in uh, like three weeks right now, so um, a little bit of a struggle uh, getting back into things. But I think just more practice and um, just making sure more consistency. These cars are a lot harder to drive. I'm also in the GT3 league, and these cars are by far. Um, I think they're easier to be quick at, but they're harder um, to drive overall, just given no traction control, no ABS. Um, but just focus and, and practice. Uh, if it says anything, I, I DNF'd in the in the first race last season, so I, I think that's a good sign coming for me if I have to take anything from it. Anyone you want to give a shout out to before we let you go? Yeah, I want to give out a shout out to the uh, YS Motorsports uh, squad. Uh, not not quite our night tonight, other than uh, Andrew had a, a good result out of it. So I think uh, congrats to Andrew on his good result. Um, but yeah, we will be back and uh, keep pushing. Evan Puckett also did well tonight for us, uh, getting a top 10 finish. So um, yeah, shout out to the YS Motorsports uh, squad. Well, congratulations on the run, or should I say, apologies for the run tonight. We'll see how you are next time out. Thank you. Corey Frecker coming away 25th tonight. And that brings us over to the other side of the car tonight. F3 competition. We have now flown over to Japan for the PRL's Formula 3 series powered by VCO. The second half of the doubleheader night here on Race Spot and VCO. Once again, Justin Prince, Joey Devin with our producer Hugo Weez as we get ready to go racing from Fuji Speedway. No chicane, the layout here that starts things off for the Japanese swing with Okayama next on the schedule early. Then you have Sonoma, Zanvor, Koda, Nurburgring, the Grand Prix circuit. Long Beach, Interlagos, the alternate Zolder layout, and of course, Barcelona, Catalonia closes things out all the way in December. Plenty of Grand Prix layout tracks on the calendar for this schedule, Joey. A lot of F3 regulars. We always seem to see Zanvort, Sonoma, Fu we saw Fuji last season. Long Beach always comes up. Zolder is back. I'm sure the rest of the field is um, as, as disappointed in that as I am. I don't know a single driver who likes driving the F3 car around Zolder, but they'll put on a good race either way. I wish I could be back in the car for uh, for Long Beach and Zanfort because those are two of my favorite tracks to drive in this F3 car. And of course, Okayama, my darling Okayama, my fav probably my favorite road course on iRacing. This is an incredible F3 calendar, and these drivers always know how to put on a good race. So book every single one of these races on your calendar because they are going to be a very, very exciting, very, very exciting uh I don't know what the word for a triumvirate for 10 races is, but either way, it'll be good. It's going to be good. Tune in. It's going to be fun. Absolutely. Let's take a look at your details. These drivers having the keys to remember open setup for this specific class. 50% fuel, 40 minutes up at the clock. That's 25 laps for tonight. 30 minutes of open qualifying currently underway. Instant points once again a factor with the open side of things, though. That means plenty of setups to be able to have to learn if you want to be quick here, Joey. 
and it really depends on where the setup comes from. We know a lot of drivers in this field love to use the VRS setup. Some people might rely on major setups and others in the, uh, the higher echelons of the order. They'll probably have their own setups that they've been designing, that their teams have been designing over the last couple of days, last couple of weeks. Down at Atomic Racing, they're probably using the Ridgeway setup tonight that Robert Ridgeway has put together for them. And that's just another interesting dynamic of an open series, an open setup series. The cars are not the same. A fixed F3 series would be pretty exciting, and it's been exciting in the PRL in the past. But open setups always shake things up, and they always make it more difficult to drive because you're trying to squeeze out even more speed. You're not just going for good racing necessarily. That's seen higher, hotter track conditions. Drivers already setting times with 17 minutes to work with. Michael Kofrey currently leads all drivers in qualifying. The 129.4. Andrew Boyne second. Alex Fournier, the multiple time champion in third. Juan Kofrey rounding up the top four with Justin Negrete currently in the fifth spot. Currently the separation from them, half a second in the only going. But the Wave Italy Racing Team car setting the bar early here in this one. Michael Frey all over the top of the timesheets with this long straight at Fuji. The draft is going to be critical. So if you've got teammates in the field, that is going to be very, very helpful for you. I think I can see in the background the Evolve Sports drivers of Waring and uh, Ozzy Milwayne are trying to work together. And speak of the devil, it works out. Andrew Waring gets the draft from his teammate Ozzy Milwayne down the longest straight, I think, in terms of grade one tracks in the world at Fuji. And Waring takes pole because of it. Meanwhile, falling on board with Kofre. We've seen good speed from Kofre in the past. It's been the major thing, though, of keeping it clean. That's popped up in the past. See how Kofre does with the bumps. Talk us through this track, though, because it's a little bit intriguing, of course, how you attack this track. This track is extremely difficult. It's one of the newest road courses on iRacing. Only got updated, uh, or only got added a few updates ago. And this section right here that we're about to watch Kofre navigate through this is one of the most difficult sectors in all of motorsports. It's off camber. It's uphill. It's it's blind braking zones. There's no markers. You're just flying by the seat of your pants here. And if your driving skills are lesser than the field around you, like mine were last season, you're just kind of flailing around here. Michael Kofrey took that pretty well, but he's going to get held up by a lap car on the outside. That's going to kill any hope he had here. But he was sliding it around through that whole sector. It looked pretty quick, but also it was very, very slidey. And think about that during the race tonight. If you're sliding around through the final sector all night, those rear tires are going to go bye bye and it's only going to exacerbate itself as you continue to slide every single lap through there. Alex Fournier, meanwhile, falling on board with the ASR machine. Fournier, we've seen lots of pace from this driver in the past. Expect him to be a threat for the title if he runs full time this season. We always expect any driver in one of these ASR purple cars to be a contender for the title in the PRL. And of course, Alex Fournier so strong in any type of open wheel car. And he's going to get a double draft here coming to the line. So if those first two laps were strong or first two sectors were strong for Fournier, rather, this could be an incredible lap as he comes to the line. He improves a little bit, but not quite enough. That double draft not helping him as much as he would have liked. But if those two cars in front of him can stay just enough ahead of him to not slow him down through the rest of this lap, he might have a chance at pole here. If he can continue to take this draft, one of my uh, former Atomic Racing teammates is up ahead. I couldn't quite identify the number, so I don't know who that is. But Fournier is getting a draft here. He is getting some help. Let's, watch, let's ride on board with him for the rest of this lap. He might just improve. He might just be able to find those two extra tenths. Steven Ritters, by the way, that's in front of him. The Rick captain. Ritz. He's doing a solid job leading this pole through the train. Fournier using every bit of eSport line possible. James Blair also is in front of him, keep in mind. So technically a three-car train building up. They make their way this time through Dunlop Corner up to turn 11. Steven Ritters is a driver you want in front of you when you're trying to when you're trying to do a little bit of a toe lap like this because he's not a driver who's going to be who's going to be making mistakes. He's not a driver who's going to be blocking you. He's going to be running rock solid laps. Unfortunately for Fournier, there's just a little bit of a traffic jam up ahead. He's going to have to back out of it and he's going to let Steven Ritters go and run his own lap here. Ritters is actually going to go off the road, so his lap's going to be invalidated as well. 
the F3 traffic jam. It's going to be a storyline all season. Of course, it's a storyline tonight with the biggest field of the season in the first round, 41 cars. Fuji's a big track, so you can find potentially an open spot somewhere. But when there's 41 cars on track, even with 30 minutes of qualifying, you're almost always going to find traffic, and it's always at the most inconvenient times. You know, remember a few times when the series went to Fuji last season, plenty of traffic jam for some of your top competitors. In fact, the opening battle of the season at Fuji impacted by traffic. Juan Cofre is currently in fourth, 129.5 as his personal best. That time was a banker time around, and Juan Cofre, a part of that whole trio of Cofres we've seen quick that is looking to turn things around this season. Yeah, I don't think Sebastian Cofre is registered this season, but Michael Cofre and Juan Cofre, both very, very strong in the past, proving it again. That last lap for Cofre, a little bit of a banker. Also, he had no draft. You're not going to get on pole in this qualifying session without a draft. That's just that's just a fact, frankly. Barbara Galata improves up to third, and you know what I guarantee you he had coming to the line? I guarantee you he had a pretty big draft. Pretty sure, absolutely. Currently the 94 up to third spot that you're referencing there. And in turn, when it comes to a racing series like this, plenty of intrigue to follow along with with some of the different newcomers I think you'll see throughout the night. Tower P.O. Richards, for example, is an eighth spot. But others have returned. If you look closely on the pylon, you may notice the 27th place car, Byron Daly. With real world experience, plenty of respect to the racing world, carnate experience on the box at one time for NASCAR Xfinity Series race, is back in this series and was a championship competitor a few seasons ago to mix things up with the Juan Cope phrase in the series. And I'd expect Byron Daly to be higher in qualifying, so look for him to, to try and find a buddy to get a draft from. Wanko Frey gets a big draft here. He's going to improve on the straight, at least the first straight, but he's not going to get uh, much in terms of the rest of the lap because the driver in front of him did just get out of the way. But speaking of the old faces, speaking of Steven Ritters, we're going to we're going to watch my teammate some more. I promise. I promise I'm not biased anymore towards Atomic Racing, but when they're doing a good job, they're doing a good job. Takeshi Kita and Steven Ritters both in the top 10 here. A dynamic we haven't talked much about here in the first couple of minutes is that this is no longer a pro-am split series. Every single driver in this series is considered to be a pro. The F4 series kind of takes over as the AM series this season with a 2,500 I rating cap. But now everybody in this series is racing for the same positions in the same class. Takeshi and Steven, both two of the strongest drivers in the AM class last season. Now that they're in a field where everybody's considered pros, they're still fighting it up there. They're still in the top 10. That was a talking point from last season, if you remember, drivers who got promotions early on to the pro class and in turn had some setbacks. Kevin San Diego, and that comes up to mind. A couple of the others who popped up. Steven Ritters, meanwhile, looking to pop his way up the pylon. 129.8 wow. does bump him up to seventh position. So Atomic Racing looking to avoid the bad luck streak they hit as an understatement to start off last season. And I think you remember that, Joey, where every car in your for your team just about crashed. Yeah, more than just about. You're, you're giving me bad memories, Justin. I didn't make it off the start line at Fuji last season. Our, our teammate Colin Heffernan, who unfortunately was uh, too busy to, to get here for this season, he had an equipment failure at the line. His car stalled. I had nowhere to go because I was behind him. Takeshi Kita had nowhere to go because he was also behind him. James Carter, I think, had uh, trouble later on in, or early on lap one in another incident. So, yeah, uh, Atomic Racing was basically entirely wiped out on lap one season last season. But hopefully better luck, better luck uh, for them this season. Hopefully better luck for everybody in round one. I hope there's no old cars at the line because this boat, this is going to be a pretty good race. Two long straights and even longer straight without that normal turn 10 chicane. That's everything you could possibly want from an F3 race. Lots of drafting, lots of opportunities for passing. Because hopefully nobody stalls in the start line this time. Meanwhile, this is Brendan Big Till. We didn't see much impact in it last season. Curly 20th. That time was a banker lap and is a part of those dynamic looking machines we've seen throughout the campaigns the past couple seasons with the teal and black. 
And our friends at Evolve Sim Sport always always putting together those those interesting liveries and a lot of those drivers were competitive in the GT3 series last season, but they elected to move over into the F3 series this season with Waring, with Milwain, with Spencer Todd, and also Brandon Victil, who we ride on board with right now. He was a top 10 driver in the GT3 Sprint series or, or the GT3 Fix series last season. I don't remember which one he was in, but either way, fast driver in all sorts of road course equipment, but... Critically, he's got no draft. We saw Steven Ritters do the lap without a draft. He did a 129.8, but that's probably around the upper limit of what you can do without a draft. Maybe a 29.7, maybe a 29.6 if you're going full alien mode. But to get up there where Andrew Waring is to get on pole, you're going to need a lot of help. So find your teammates out there. Get them to drag you along. Here is Garbage Lena that you mentioned earlier on. Meanwhile, still third on board this is the 94 machine watch as one driver spins off of the grass but so far so good for car 94 just one tenth off the pole so far barbara galata one of those drivers who wasn't here last season so it's always good to see a, a a new name returning to the at the top of the time sheets i should say not returning he wasn't here last season He's going to have no help on this lap again. This will be an interesting uh, interesting mar marker to measure, whatever word you want to use, to see what lap he can do without any help. He crosses the line. It's going to be a 131-1. So not a very good lap from Barbara Galata and no help whatsoever in the draft. So that lap was never going to be an improvement. As the Atomic Racing driver, the number 70 of James Carter behind, if he can, if he can back up, he might be able to see a little bit of help from James, but... Right now, I think Barbara Galata might actually be happy with third. He's just kind of hot lapping around right now, hoping that eventually a car in traffic ends up in front of him that can pull him forward. Finish with that run from Panasonic corner all the way to turn one. That pole expect to be huge today for competitors, Ritters, that banker. Meanwhile, take a look at Kevin San Diego in the 88. Black machine coming down that straightaway. At the longest straightaway here of this racetrack today with the no chicane. Already seen plenty of drivers reach speeds of more than 150, nearly 160 miles an hour without the draft alone here today. We saw Raymond Day improve up into the top 10, so that's going to drop Kevin San Diego another position. Again, no help on that lap whatsoever, but San Diego big name returning to the series this season he had some struggles in the pro class last season but the at the end of the season he was very very strong in contention for the win at montreal before he had a spin in contention for the win at road atlanta i think if i'm remembering correctly and also another driver who competes in multiple series in the prl he's in the mx5 cup series this season on monday so mx5s and f3 what more could you want you could probably want a little bit better of a run through turn six because he clipped the grass a little bit him a little bit of time on the racetrack. San Diego, we've seen some bursts of speed from last season in particular. 14th in the standings. Picked up a few DNFs in the early stages, though. Last campaign. Looking back along the front straightaway, as mentioned, Ritter's leading the draft train. Vargas, the one behind him currently. Another 136. Vargas, no recorded lap. Tony, I mean, while not too much draft, in fact, any draft to work with, he ran a 129.502 last time. This time has to dodge the traffic. And that's going to kill this chance at pole for him instantly. Just that one checkup with that one lap car. That's enough to ruin a qualifying lap. He's going to back off, I think, here and set up for another lap through the new turn 10, which is in my opinion, way better than the turn 10 with the hairpin. I guess it's worse of a passing opportunity, but it's it's a lot more pleasant to drive. I personally prefer it quite a bit. Tyler Pierre Richards has a long history of uh, successful drivers named Richards in the PRL F3 series. Of course, Christopher Richards, who I think we'll be seeing in the F4 series later this season, but Tyler Pierre Richards actually does just improve on that lap by two whole thousandths of a second. Doesn't improve him at all, but an improvement's an improvement, I guess. He stays in the top 10. Keep in mind, one of the major things to consider here, no David Holland tonight, no Connor Wagner tonight. Hard point by Delta Sport was a major player last season. No cars from them here to start off the season. 
And Connor Wagner won eight out of 10 races in the F3 series last season. He could have won nine, but he didn't actually show up to the championship finale. So technically he won eight out of nine races last season and his uh, teammate, I believe, beat him to the only other race. So the fact that hard point by Delta Sport isn't here tonight really does open up the field again. Connor's racing in the GT3 Sprint Series this season in that in that sort of Champions League we have going on over there with half the PRL champions of last season competing in one series. But the F3 Series still has a ton of championship caliber drivers here all finding each other at the top of the timesheets. No more Connor Wagner at the top, but that opens up the door. That opens up the throne for another driver to take on that dominant role. You're saying that with Alex Forney a year who I remember also dominated at one point when he won his most recent championship with that special gold car he had at one point. Gold car or purple car? I don't, I don't know which one's going to be better luck for him. The ASR, the ASR purple cars are always good, but if you put yourself in a shiny gold car, if, if you're not winning in that thing, like that's almost not possible. Shiny gold in the car, it becomes like a second a lap faster. special paint scheme at that time. That was earlier on in this year's calendar year. During 2022 season one. And yes, he is. Not enough to pass a car, though, by two one thousandths of a second. Check that three one thousandths. Down to the final two minutes of qualifying. Manuel Vargas, we mentioned his name. Monsters looking to jump high, high, high above how they did last year on the pylon. Right now, 15th in the session with the bit of draft, 130.3, two tenths off. He's a little bit too far back from, I think that's still uh, Steven Ritters in front of him. Ritters is on quite a long run and Vargas is on an incredibly long run as well following him. But he was, if I had to guess, if I had to estimate, probably like 1.2 seconds or so behind. And that's just not close enough to get the benefit of the draft. And that's where we see Vargas not improving at all. Time is ticking down. Last laps are going to have to count now. We're underneath that 129 mark. So all of these laps that are that are ending here are going to be the final laps of driver's sessions. Raymond Day just got demoted by Kevin San Diego back down to 10th. He's going to have no help, but he doesn't really need help, I don't think, to improve. But that little loss there, that's going to throw him off for the rest of this final sector. Raymond Day from Ninja Trader is founder and executive chairman. Remember, he was one of the championship competitors about a year ago as well in this call. The main thing that all the 77, though, a couple of seasons ago when we last seen him, whenever it was halfway, it was spin around time for day. And doesn't improve on that lap, unfortunately. But you know how you can improve your trading skills with Ninja Trader. How about that for an ad? You guys should, uh, you guys should give me some extra for that. But let's watch, let's watch Kevin San Diego for one final time. I've held myself back all week for doing the joke I want to do with Kevin San Diego's name. I'm sure he's heard it like about a million times over the course of his life, because of course he has. But as he comes through the final corner here, this is his last chance to improve. And I'm gonna go. Bop, do, do, ba, do, bop. Where in the world is Kevin San Diego? He's down the front straight away, coming to the checker flag. I'm not a good singer. Kevin San Diego puts up a solid time of a 129.8. No improvement in position though. You know why that time improved though? That's because that's because I sang a. Uh, Rockapella, that's why. So I'm gonna keep doing that for the rest of the season. Kevin San Diego, I'll help you out. He's able to improve, but that looks like the last real potential improvement. I guess Byron Daly might improve. He's lower than we'd expect. He's gonna be likely the last driver to cross the line, I think. When you're a former pro, you're expected to be inside the top five every single waking moment of your entire existence on the racetrack. Correct. And the major thing for Daly, his quickest time, a 130.2. The difference between him and Day, three tenths of a second. That's how big the difference is of just a couple tenths of a second today. Really sawing at the wheel through the final sector. It's not smooth at all. It kind of looks like how I was how I was driving this last sector. There's a lot of mid corner adjustments. It's going to be destroying the tires, I think, in when race time comes. But let's see him run to the line. It was a decent exit through the final corner, so he should have a, a decent amount of momentum here. He's not going to improve much because he has no draft, but let's see. It's tracking decently, but he's not going to be able to improve 
It's going to be P20 for Byron Daly. I'm sure he's going to be disappointed with that, but we got 40 minutes of racing coming up. It's the first round of the season. It's turn one at Fuji coming up. P20 might not be the worst place to be, or it might, because that's actually exactly in the middle of the field. I don't know. Can't predict it. 41 cars have flown to Japan to see if they can finish all 25 laps, let alone with solid positions. Now it's time to see how they'll start things off here at Fuji Speedway, an adventure expected for some after an adventurous last time for this series at this racetrack. 25 laps up on the board for our competitors tonight. And Andrew Waring starts off of the pole with a 129.3 over Michael Cofre. Then it's our Aglada in third spot. Alex Bournier, the multiple time series champion in four. Juan Cofre and James Malore, your top six tonight. Steven Ritter's in seventh. Justin Negrani starts in eighth. Kevin San Diego, Raymond Day, the top 10. Tower Pierre Richards starts 11th. Takeshi Kita. One of his better starting positions in a while. Remember, he was one of the hard chargers last season in 12. Ozzie Milwayne starts 13th. Jake Pont, Manuel Vargas, Nick Horvath, the top 16. Brett Thurman and Brian DeVries, the top 18. Joey Hayes and Byron Daly, amongst your top 20 starters. With Britannia iSports, driver Michael Broomhead in 21st. Brennan Wicktail starts in 22nd. And you have Oak Nin in 23rd. Top 24. Campbell, the John, along with Quinn, Miles, Carter, and Miller, your top 30 starters. A bunch of noteworthy drivers towards the back tonight. Richard Swindell's 32nd on the starting grid. Lucio Vargas back to 36th amongst your final times. 38 drivers set times tonight, putting two privateers and newcomers for tonight. 41 entries tonight. Just about all set to go, waiting for the last of the drivers to make their way to the starting grid. Your keys to victory. Survive turn one. I just saw last season's champion Connor Wagner in the chat saying he thinks it's going to be a clean lap one. And Connor, I sure hope you're right, because I want to see 41 of these drivers fighting each other for the next 40 minutes here. I'm so excited to actually be on this side of the F3 series this season. I kind of wish I was still in the car, but this works too. Of note, three drivers who had initially entered tonight's action, not in the paddock, Eric Kalunga, Steven Martinez, Michael Kalunga. All the drivers, though, have made their way to the starting blocks. We're all set to go from Fuji. The F3 series is underway from Japan. Good launch from the 33, Michael Kofre trying to come up multiple lines. Alex Fournier holds on to the inside, a hard set for third as they go 3-4 near 5 wide, nearly stopping into the first chicane. No major contact outside of 16th place. Ryan Miles and a couple others slowing up. Looks like Brendan Victil's dropping down the order. That car might be damaged, but other than that, way better through turn one than we were last season. No drama other than Victil, who I think is on recovery mode. He might not be damaged, but he's falling way, way down the order. Other than that, though, all 38 drivers, or at least almost all 38 drivers, Brad Miller's gone around, and I think Nick Horvath in the background is missing a rear wheel. So they're the only two casualties from the first couple corners. An air evolved car and Victail just had to pull off the track. So Horvath driving with a broken car. The leaders, though, keeping things calm for the extent of the leaders. Well, just oh. as they say that, the 94 nearly goes off the track. There goes James Malore. Another car spins off. That's Brett Thurman for Speedworks. Brett Thurman got wiped out. I think it turned 10 even more trouble in the background. One of the atomic racing cars is around. That's Steven Ritters from the top 10. We got cleanly through the first half of the lap, and it's all kicking off through the final sector on these cold tires. Manuel Vargas is around. Steven Ritters, Brett Thurman, Juan Cofre, Brian DeFries. It's all kicking off in the back, and it's all kicking off in the front, too. Michael Cofre is going to lead the lap one. The draft causes the swap around. Up to the lead goes Michael Cofre to lead things off. Warring the second. Fournier holding on to third with a decent buffer. Already some separation of more than a second between fifth and sixth as a result of some of the checkups. They can look meanwhile at the 94. Right behind them, the Sins are on amongst the top 12 or so. 
Byron Daly, we talked about him at the end of the qualifying session, about how 20th isn't normally where we'd expect him to be. He's made up seven spots on lap one, got into no trouble whatsoever, and he advanced seven spots from his starting position up into lucky 13th ahead of Potts, who's a new name this season, and the uh, the stalwart of PRL competition, old Michael Broomhead, back there in 15th, trying to chase him down. Broomhead currently in the 15th position on the racetrack. Amongst those charging to the pack as a result of the attrition, Ryan Miles up 11, 12 spots as well picked up for the 42. What an adventurous start for some. Daly already leaning pack two, but already need to close up a second and a half, two seconds. He's pulled away from Jake Potts, though, because of some battling building up behind him, you see, with Broomhead. Yeah, Potts got too wide in turn 10, clipped the grass, and that's given Michael Broomhead that little peak up to the inside of him. Wasn't able to send it. He's going to back out a little bit through the final corner. He's going to get a better run through the second half of the corner, though. And the longest straight in the world. Here we go. Michael Broomhead in the draft of Potts. He's in that critical distance where you can easily blow by the driver in front. Speaking of that critical distance, it's just a switchback fest between Waring and Cofrey. Waring on by Waring indeed. Up to first with the swap. Fournier has fell and falling back to the third fourth spot rather behind the Lord. And some of the swaps. But that's to be expected here, right, with the draft, and that helps in turn save a bit of fuel. That yep. doesn't help you see positions like that. Matthew Miles to 29th, and Eric Carr coming out and on with them, John Quinn. Yeah, I think Quinn and Miles had two separate instants there, but the switch around that you're seeing Waring and Cofrey do, I think, is the optimal move to be doing right now. Both drivers seem to have pretty equal pace. They were equal in qualifying. They're equal on race pace right now. You might hold each other up if you're still trying to fight for this lead, so you might as well let the driver who's sticking with you get by, save a little bit of fuel behind him for one lap, then jump him again, then switch back again, and it's, it's straightforward stuff. Switch back and forth, and then once we get through the pit cycle, which we will be doing in uh, who knows how many minutes time. That's all. That always differs in the Precision Racing League, but it will happen, and then we'll start to see the gloves come off. Then we'll see some legit racing between Cofrey and Waring, but for now, they're both helping each other out, even though they're from two different teams. I'm trying to build a little bit of a buffer in turn. Keep in mind that it can be difficult to pull away of that technical precision, yes. Michael Cofrey, the lift and coast, now on down the straightaway, not electing for the swap. The 33 as the fuel margin. Ballure trying to keep within the one second. That's the critical thing, though, because remember, Last year, some of those drivers we mentioned in the championship fight ran away and waltzed away the draft. By the way, this is what happened to Brett Thurman. And watch for the big send. Oh, Bye. DeFreeze. Brian DeFreeze just outbraked himself into turn 10 and just killed Brett Thurman there. Meanwhile, the 86 machine, look at the battle for 21st. This train going up to 18th this replay. This was at the same time and sent him off and spinning. Yeah, same time, same thing. Quacked in, bad luck. You can see it in the background there, actually. We'll see what happened to Juan Cofrey as well. That's Steven Ritters in front of him. Did Ritters get a push from Cofrey? Yes, indeed, he did. That corner, turn 10. There's no braking marker necessarily, so there's always differences between where other drivers are slowing down, what lines other people are taking, and on lap one, if you're not as cognizant of your surroundings as you should be, you're going to end up punting somebody. Manuel Vargas, though, was very cognizant of the driver in front, actually backed out extra, and that's what spun that car around, and I have a feeling we're going to see exactly the same thing here at turn one with Miles and Quinn. Oh, Miles tried to swerve out of the way and then lost it again, and Quinn couldn't get out of the way. Spin cycles continue with more replays. How about Miles? Take a look. This is actually just moments ago with Rayer with the Modern Racing Prince GP car. Send him a bit for a loop around to 31st position on the racetrack. So plenty of incidents popping up at certain marks. Meanwhile, the 94 is holding on to one of the main trains currently formed up. San Diego. That's where he is in sixth position with Justin Negretti in the train. Kevin's made up a few spots here to open up the day, and he is 
He's very, very quick right now. He's chasing down Barbara Galata. Negrete is in the background here. Another driver who really, really turned it on at the end of the season. He was strong all season, but in those final couple of rounds at Montreal or Road Atlanta, he had a lot of speed. Oh. He had a lot of chances of victory, and there goes Barbara Galata around. Barbara Galata having to regather it up. And on the right side of the racetrack, so move him outside the top 10. Strong start. Now, already seen a falter clip of the grass. That's what happens. Can't put a wheel off in the grass there. That's happened to me so many times in this car with how light it is. The grip difference. When you put two tires in the grass, you have two tires on the asphalt. That is just a, a free ticket to spin land. And Barbara Galata just barely throws it off the road, trying to commit as hard as possible, which you have to do in turn 10. It's a fast corner, but it's just a little bit too much. And he's going to fall down to P13, but... That bodes well for our viewing product here because he's going to be another driver driving his way through the field, trying to advance back up. He has podium pace. He's just got to make up 10 spots to get back up there. Meanwhile, one of your hard chargers for almost every race last season, Takeshi Kita was known as Mr. Sneaky during last campaign. So far, he's been slowly crawling to the pack. He's up to 10th, the plus two so far. And Takeshi's one of those drivers who really turns it on at the end of the race. He's not hes not like me. He doesn't destroy the tires early on, trying to be as aggressive as humanly possible. That's why we call him Mr. Sneaky. He just calm, cool, collected, drives conservatively, and it always works out for him, except when he's getting taken out by people. But that's why he was a championship contender last season. Didn't quite work out. Ryan Pucktell was the driver who ended up taking the championship last season. But Takeshi is always a strong driver, always consistent and it's always no surprise to see him advance who knows how many spots. Take a look at him meanwhile. 86 machine, one of those with the VR attachments tonight and a direct drive wheel. Looking to wheel his way around some of the traffic. Remember, he got looped around at one point. Back up to 20th, though, despite the spin. Kwaknin always, always a dangerous competitor in the GT3 uh, AM divisions. He's always on the podium. He's always racing for seconds and thirds in the win. It's good to see him back in the F3 series. Good to see him competing in another road discipline. And it's good to see his VR again at a different angle than last season. He's still just critically out of that draft range. He needs to be about half a second closer to really take advantage of that. But look at Takeshi Kita again, up another spot. Gets by Richards again. Kita, one of the quickest cars on the racetrack. He's quicker than some of the draft, mind you. Every car except for the race leader currently. Clips a little bit of the grass this time with Pierre Richards trying the long way. Here comes Joey Hayes looking for the send back, though, to the hairpin. Where's the battle? Byron Daly joins the party. It's not really a corner where if you send it to the inside, the move ever works. Haynes just kind of peeked to the inside, said, hey, hey, Tyler, Pierre Richards, I'm here. I might make that move a little bit later. It wasn't a real attempt at a move, I don't think. Through turn 10, just the highest commitment possible. Don't clip that grass, Takeshi. You don't want to do what Barbara Galata did. You can see him in the background, actually, just rejoining this train. It's been a great recovery for Barbara Galata after that spin. With this little train here, he's been able to close it back up, and he's got four drivers that he knows he has more pace than right now who he's got to work his way through. That's where the patience level's definitely coming to play. As the snake forms up down the middle of the straightaway this time, Daly going to slice his way up to the 11th spot. Not picking up too much draft, though. He's not making it easy. Joey Haynes is actually going to end up getting the draft from Tyler Pierre Richards. Tyler's kind of switching around. He's like, who do I give the draft to? Do I give it to Tyler? Do I give it to Byron? Heck, I'll just give it to nobody because they're going to continue to fight into turn one. Daly on the outside doesn't quite work out for him. Joey Haynes is going to hang on for P11 back in the F3 series after some, uh, some GT3 exploits last season. Glad to see him back in the F3 series where he's had a few wins and got to hold off Byron Daly, though, who has been far, far more uh, scary in the race than he has been in than he was in qualifying. Take a look at the replay. This happened moments oh, ago no. and another atomic racing car with trouble. And James Carter lost it through turn 10. I, I didn't see if he clipped the grass or not. I think I think he just got a little bit loose on the rear end. And Matthew Miles, nowhere to go. Matthew Miles has had some some bad luck. He's had some, some bad luck of his own so far tonight, and 
It's not going to get any better, but I think James Carter might get away with that. He, it was a fairly straight hit to the, the rear tire of that car, so hopefully he has no suspension damage. But Jake Potts, speaking of suspension damage, speaking of front wing damage, that was a hard hit. He did pick up mandatory repairs from that contact. Jake Potts is in the pit lane with damage repair. Look again back at the draft pack forming up ninth all the way back to 13th. 94 has closed in back to this respective group. Three seconds back of Mill Wayne. Or send again. Daly wants to go ahead. Daly wants to send his way to the corner. Now is under attack from behind as well. Not late enough on the brakes, though. The outside isn't going to work for Joey Haynes, but he's still going to be side by side with Byron Daly. Side by side here is always difficult. Byron's going to try and stick it around the outside. He's off in the runoff. Well done, Joey Haynes, for, for backing out of that and ensuring di both of their survival. But because he backed out of that, Barbara Galata's going to get by. And of course, Byron Daly is going to get by as well. But that is one of the toughest places to go side by side. Turn three at Fuji. Wow. Barangalana indeed now back up to the 12th position as a result of that. In the small packs, we've seen the trends of last year have come into play. Now it becomes the question, how will these strategies play out? We've seen in the past, Joey, a lot of drivers like to go as far as possible. How difficult will that be in terms of your entry in turn for the pit lane for executing that strategy here at Fuji? Fuji is one of the trickiest pit entries. We know it caught people out last season. It caught my teammate Steven Ritters out last season. It caught people out in the GT4 race we ran here in the PRL last season. The pit entry line is coming up right there. You see Tyler Pierre Richards drive by at that bright, solid white line. That's the pit entry line. And notice how far back it is from the pit lane. You have to commit so early, you cannot commit late or else you will get an unsafe pit entry penalty and you, you have to avoid that. I think drivers have learned from last season that you have to commit very, very early to the pit lane here at Fuji. And I don't think we'll see anybody break that, but if drivers haven't been practicing their pit entry or some of our new drivers who weren't here last season, they might be fall for the old Fuji trick. Timmy Vaughn to catch Shikita fighting off Pierre Richards. Able to hold him off for the time being for night. That does cost him a little bit of ground today in Millwain, though. I'm back up from this 9th to 13th train. Coming up 15 laps to go already in this race. Currently, 29 cars still running. Not significant damage. But 30th on back of the pylon has had to come in for repairs at one point or another. Keita hits the rumble strips. Keita hits the grass. And Richard's not able to hit the go button, though. Well done, Takeshi, for actually saving that car. He didn't loop it around on the grass like Barbara Galata did, but... He's also got to be careful doing things like that. Instant points came into conversation at Laguna Seca in the F4 race earlier tonight. They're going to come into conversation at Fuji as well because there are a lot of places on this track, as there frequently are at grade one tracks on iRacing, where you can build up the one X's very, very quickly. There's some scary curbs that kind of discourage you from going off at some corners, but still, there's places like the outside of turn three, where Takeshi went off in the grass at turn 10, where those one X's can really, really rack up, but... For now, he's got more uh, more prurient things to worry about because here comes Tyler Pierre Richards back to the outside again. Richards trying to make that stick again. Here he goes wide, nearly off to the edge of the racetrack as Keita able to squish him back. And here comes Barbara looking now to the left of the track, going off to Coca-Cola corner, not able to make anything work up to 100R. And again, that slows up the group even more. And that has to be the major thing, right? When you battle so much, the more you fight, the more ground you lose. And when somebody sends it to the inside of you in turn six, like Barbara Galata just did, you're going to lose even more ground with absolutely no uh, positive that could possibly come from that because moves through turn six never actually work. So they're going to slow each other down even more. Takeshi's going to look at his mirrors and say, thank you very much, Nicholas. I appreciate you slowing this down a little bit. But also... Barbara Galata was running in third before he had his spin at turn 10. He should be higher up than this. It might only be a matter of time until he finally gets by these guys and then sets his sights forward to the rest of the field. But also, you still want to minimize that. You want to hold him back for as long as possible. You're not just going to let him by and run his own race. You've still got your own race to run. He might spin again. He might not get by you after all. 
Still the patience game breaking out along these straightaways right now. Keep in mind, lap traffic being reached by the leaders. Something to focus towards later on in this race will be how lap traffic plays a factor. Here it comes, Arbigalana. Not able to make a move though. Right at the edge of the rev limiter, just couldn't get the power. Again, that's that open setup. The open setup of the series coming back to bite. Some drivers have gone for a lower downforce setup. Some drivers have gone for higher gear ratios. You can be faster on that long straight. And other drivers have elected, you know, I'm a, I want to be faster through the actual corners at Fuji. I want to make my moves on the track instead of in a straight line or in the corners instead of a straight line, rather. But I'd say the dominant, the dominant move is to favor that front straight because I've personally experienced it many times in this series. When you go for a high downforce setup at a track with long straights like Spa, for example, even if you have an advantage through the corners, actually making the move is so tough because the drivers in front of you are just going to be able to get straight back by you and expand like a second lead on the straight. So higher downforce setup working out for a lot of these drivers, but still there's differences between those. There's higher gear ratios. There's faster speeds at the end of the straights for drivers that aren't Barbara Kapata, apparently. And your contact amongst them. Still able to separate out of note. One of the top drivers has pit. One of the Knox E-Motorsports cars. This is James Mahore. That's come in. That is not for a scheduled stop, though, Joey. That is a black flag for one of the top drivers on the track. Meanwhile, here comes the 94. Zip on by here, Richards. Penalty already 13 laps into the race. We're only halfway through, so he's going to have to be very, very careful. James Malaire only has four incident points to play with for the rest of the night. So you better be careful. Tyler Pierre Richards is going to have to be careful. Gets a little bit loose off the exit of turn three. That's an interesting place to get loose. Clearly, his defense from Barbagalata took a lot out of those tires, but he's still got 12 more laps to run on him. Through turn six, still looks a little bit wiggly. How Pierre Richards' rear tires, they're getting cooked a little bit right now. This is coming right towards the halfway point. In fact, just past the halfway point. Still a long ways to go, potentially, for some drivers towards their pit stops. Remember the fuel tanks. In last season's campaign, lasted about up to 35 minutes at the very most. And there's always a pit stop, and it always comes, I think, at the, the very end of the, the pit cycle, for, or the, the end of the fuel cycle, the end of the fuel tank. Because there's no reason, again, like I said in the F4 series, there's no reason to come in early. Because there's no tire change, there's no advantage that can come from that. The only advantage that can come from that is if the drivers in front of you are getting held up in a big train. Then you might want to duck down pit road, get some clean track, and hop them all. But the advantage in this series generally comes from stretching it out for as long as possible, putting as little fuel as possible in to get to the end of the race. So we're going to be waiting until the very, very end of this fuel tank. There's not going to be splitting this race in half. We're going to be waiting a little bit longer for, for any semblance of legitimate pit cycles to start. Well, the lighter the car, the faster the car. Less fuel we have, the lighter the car ends up getting, right? That's what we call science on race spot. <laughs> Myron Daly trying to find a way to figure out around some of these cars. Just hasn't been able to crack that puzzle of how to pass the driver in front. The Ninja Trader Esports machine has been riding in the 11th spot here for the past five laps. And the head of the train again is Takeshi Kita. Barbara Galata is going to peek to the inside of him, and I think that's going to be an easy move for Barbara Galata. Takeshi's trying to fight on the outside. It's not going to be as easy as I thought. I thought Takeshi might back out of that one and let Nicholas through, but no, he's going to force him back to the outside. Barbara Galata almost eats a big yellow sausage on the outside of the track. They're still side by side through the entirety of the final sector. And Nicholas is finally going to get ahead, but he's going to be at a disadvantage on the straight here. Takeshi and Tyler and Byron. It's a four-way battle down the straight. We might be four wide going into turn one. We're going to be three least, wide at least. Yes, indeed. Bit of a stall, though, for Pierre Richards. Back to two wide. Barbara Galana shuffling to the inside goes Kita. Daly thinks about going up the middle. Daly goes to the right. Daly goes off set three. 
Sends it up the inside of Barbara Galana. Gets one. Now looks to get two with Pierre Richards on the left side. Coming up to Coca-Cola corner. Coming at 10 laps to go. Still, Pierre Richards able to play defense. Barbara Galana trying to get the spot back as this has allowed Joey Haynes back into the mix. Barbara Galata's going to wash out on the outside. He's going to get in the, not quite the grass. He's going to get in the sod on the exit of a 100R there. Not going to be able to make the move on Byron Daly, but that was a fantastic move into turn one by Byron. Well done to him getting that car slowed down, getting the two for one special. He was fourth in line coming into that corner and he got by two and one, lost one spot to Pierre Richards into turn three, but still Byron Daly very very strong on the brakes there that's going to be worrying for any other driver who's trying to battle him into turn one because how do you outbreak somebody who can stop as late as that keep in mind the pit window is open two drivers main scheduled stops will be a not Manuel Vargas last time by so we'll see if anyone elects to go for the undercut try and get away from the trouble they snake around Barbara Galan is thinking about it he's losing touch to the draft Thought about the fake out, goes into the pit lane. Thought about the fake out and then did the reel out instead. I, I wonder, could this potentially be a penalty because he got one X at turn five? I don't think it is. This looks completely legitimate. He pulls into his pit box. So Barbara Galata has been far kinder on the incident points than, I don't even remember who got the penalty at this point. I think it was Malaire, who's also still in his yep. pit stop. So maybe that wasn't a, uh, if that wasn't a black flag after all, I don't know what's going on there. But Barbara Galata, scheduled service, the first real driver to come down. Not going to be any undercut to come from it, but he's just got to sit there and wait. Hope he doesn't get held up by some drivers at the back of the field. Did you just call your competitors robots? Did I call my competitors robots? I don't, I don't know. You said real real driver. Oh. I'm playing around. Good question. Good question. I don't know. Maybe they are robots. James Moyer, by the way, is out of the race. He picked up a mandatory here. The reason he came back down. Still keeping an eye on Kita. We are Richards Daly. Perspective run up through Nets. All 13 and 14. Now separated out and see if anyone else peeks in. Atomic Racing Machine bonus up their biggest buffer in a while. Barbara Galat has actually just come out, not quite in traffic, but only a second and a half ahead of him is Matthew Miles. Then a second and a half, second and a half ahead of him is James Carter. And then there's a little bit of a window up to Sanadakis. So it should be fairly straightforward for Barbara Galata back there. I don't think he'll get held up oh, too much. Oh, you mentioned Barbara Galata's name. Oh, no. He just looped it. The 94 is in the grass right now. Barbara Galata's luck has ran dry and the curse strikes again. Now, I don't think it's technically a curse if it's a driver making a mistake for their own, but turn 10 strikes again. That's what really struck again for Barbara Galata. Just extra fuel in the car, heavier vehicle, not used to the heavier weight of that fuel in that car, and he drives it off into turn 10 again. Any advantage he would have got from getting out of this train, it's all gone now. He's lost eight seconds to Matthew Miles, so do the math. That's about seven seconds that he's going to lose to everybody in this train. Actually, and Takeshi Kita gets loose out of turn six. Richards nearly becoming very acquainted to the rear wing of Keita. And able to keep it off him. Byron Daly also able to check up in time with that. Coming to eight laps to go in this race. Still battling for eight like cats and dogs as well as with some parrots mixed in. I also got to correct myself. This is the F3 series. We're in Japan. It's over steer. I, I do too many PRL series. I got a, I got a code switch from when I'm going from NASCAR to GTs to NASCAR again, then to F3. I got to figure out how to code switch between over steer and loose, but that'll happen later in the season. Co Frey's coming into pit road as well. Another real driver on pit road and Negrete too. So the calls coming in for Wave Italy with Day from Ninja Trader. Wave also coming in. Got some racing cars. Here's the look at Peter you know, Richards on the dime. Wayne also coming on in. Scheduled stops underway for your race leaders. 4.7 seconds. The benchmark by Michael Kofrey in the pit lane. 5.2 for Day. Negrete 5.4. Millwayne 5.3. A month the lengthier stops. 
nobody was really in like a fuel save train. Waring and Kofrey were, were fighting a little bit in the early stages of the race. They were saving fuel while pretending to fight, just switching back a little bit. But then Waring just pulled away, pulled about a second gap, and Kofrey wasn't able to save any fuel behind him. So that's why all the pit times are, are probably going to look pretty similar here for the for the rest of this pit cycle for the rest of this night around high fours low fives that's that's around the same but when you're in a train like everybody was like Gita and Richards and ever Pierre Richards rather and, and they all were that half a second between 4.8 and 5.3 that's what differs your position at the head of the train from your position at the back of the train we ride on board with James Carter right now who hasn't pitted of course he's on zoom we got to take a look at him and he's he's still driving around well justin we saw him get piled in the in the rear by matthew miles but that car seems fine still has his biggest fan cheering him on as well over his shoulder indeed he does that's realism for james carter you get a, you get a lot of air in this f3 car there's no halo on this thing no arrow screen so james cooling himself down i don't know what that shirt is ksu James is in Georgia, so I would, I would expect some kind of Georgia school. I'll have to ask him about that after. But more importantly, here come all the leaders in. Wearing amongst those who have come in, Fournier just completed the stop. So where are things cycled? Well, Waring has cycled to a sizable margin. And yes, he picked up somehow five seconds, I believe, to the Michael Colfrey machine. Yeah, he's just been pulling away after after they were kind of evenly matched in the, the initial stages of the race. After that, Waring just said, you know what? I'm driving off into the sunset here. I'm going to keep on moving and I'm going to pull the gap lap by lap by lap. The difference between them on pit road was literally zero on pit lane. Rather, 35.1 seconds for Waring, 35.1 for Kofre. So that difference all came down to Andrew Waring's speed. And it is north of four and a half seconds now. Takeshi Kita still has to come in. He's been able to stretch the fuel for as long as anybody. But after that, Andrew Waring's going to have a super comfortable lead for the final run in this race. Well, so you have to come in Brad Miller, who was involved in the incident earlier. Amongst those able to pick up some time with the strategies, Kevin San Diego. One lap overcut over Justin Gretti, breaking up that group in there a little bit. Raymond Day trying to hold on to their draft as well. If through seventh. But a quiet run for San Diego. By the time things cycle with Kita, likely up to fourth position on the racetrack. Keshi finally in, last driver, or will be the last driver, second to last driver when Brad Miller comes in. Also, I did just uh, look it up. KSU is Kennesaw State University, which is in Georgia. So that makes sense for James Carter. So hopefully, he, uh, hopefully he waits like two minutes when he watches this broadcast back before he sends me a message about that. But anyway, the battle for what will become fourth, what could become the podium if stuff goes wrong up front, San Diego versus Negretti, and then Raymond Day behind. It's going to be a three-way battle for fourth. This season in ASR Esports Machine, trying to find his way forward. 16 seconds back of the leader. Keep in mind, Raymond Day's in the popcorn seat. Five car lengths back from this. The good view of how this could play out. Negretti is in good position, though, to pounce with the draft next time if he wants. And it becomes kind of a question of timing here. If these guys are actually evenly matched on pace for the next five laps, if they're in a pack here, if one of them isn't able to run away, how long do you wait? Can you afford to wait? Do you wait for a, a run through the final corner to beat the driver to the line? Or do you just go for the move as soon as it comes to you? That's always the dilemma that you have in your mind in a situation like this. Personally, I'm one to go for the move because if you if you wait for that opportunity through the final corner for a final run to the line, it might not come to you. You've just got to take the chances when they come. And Justin Negretti, here is his chance down the front straight. He's half a second behind. That's going to be a good distance for him. San Diego's going to try and weave a little bit, but Negretti should be close enough coming into turn one, I think, to send a dive if he is just that little bit closer. Going out a bit of San Diego, Negretti within four car lengths, back down to three. Not close enough as he hits the edge of the rev limiter. It's close enough to hold on to the rear wing, though. So these three drivers stay fairly tight. 48 for reference, five seconds up the track. It's got around lap traffic. Air packs of note on the track. Pierre Richards is grouped up with Haynes for ninth and 10th. Kita has pulled away an eighth. 
Part of the reason for some of the breakups, too. How about the 94 with more trouble? Barber Galata around again, just loses the rear tires up for the top of the corner. He's been he's been troubled in the back of the field. He's been pushing very, very hard. And as I mentioned in that sector, your mistakes just exacerbate themselves. I don't know what happened to Hurlitzky there. That car just looped around. That must have been a, a very heavy brake or something with the brake bias reset that looped him around there. That was very, very strange. But there is another battle further back in the field. I believe we are watching James Doherty right now back in the series with the Britannia iSports team. Always here with us. He's battling with Manuel Vargas for P17, one of the, the closest battles on track. It's still for 17th, but every point counts. He is up 16 positions, though, so far, James is. Last time by, did lose time. Vargas for reference. We'll see how things play out here with the 61, with four to go this time by, and that's how you pick up a spot, a spun car into the grass. That's Vargas. Turn 10 strikes again. It's not just you, Barbara Galata. Manuel Vargas falls to the turn 10 grass as well. And that is the easiest way to make a move when the driver in front of you just erases themselves from existence. And now he's going to have a battle of his own with Swindells, who's also made up a ton of positions. But let's ride on board with them over the curb and then grass and curb and asphalt. Three different uh, coefficients of friction there. And the car loops around and he loses two spots because of it. But three laps to go, Manuel. All he has to do is not hit that again. And he's still on for a top 20 with his a good recovery from his starting position. He was further down than we expect. Swindells was also far down. Both of them have done great jobs driving their way through the field. Double digits of improvement from their grid spots. When we seen involved in troubles earlier, still able to recover on a four lap difference to well, trying to sort things together. Byron Daly, by the way, this is for position at a 44 second pit stop sequence, Joey. That's the sign of speeding when you have a 40 second hold or 40 seconds more than your expected stop in the case of Daly. So Daly 20th on track now. It also smells like a potential unsafe pit entry with that uh, that white line I mentioned, but I don't know. I didn't see Byron Daly come in, but you're exactly right. 44 seconds that that stinks of a penalty. And I think that is what happened to Byron. So unfortunately for him, he's he's battling with Sanadakis for the last spot in the top 20. But the last spot in the top four is still being fought. And Negretti's got ahead of San Diego. We missed that happening. I think it happened on the straight. But now we see San Diego fight back. San Diego seems to have a little bit better of a car on the straights. So watch for him when we come to the front straight again. If you can stick with him, San Diego should be able to, to blow by again in a turn one. That's going to be a major thing, though, keeping up with Negretti. And remember, that 66 ASR this season. Quick win. They've gone in space. They are some of the quicker cars right now, with Fournier still holding on to the podium. See, San Diego staying within six car lengths, though. Still needs to close that up in about half for the exit, potentially for Panasonic. Yeah, that straight line speed advantage only really matters if he's within the draft range or within about probably four tenths of a second, half a second to Negretti. Negretti wasn't Negrete wasn't able to make the move from five tenths back, but San Diego might be because he seems to be a little bit faster in straights. But let's see through the final corner here. San Diego elects a little bit narrower line than Negrete does, but it's a good exit by Justin Negrete. He's got almost eight tenths of a second back to Kevin San Diego. So Kevin's not going to be able to get close enough to make the move into turn one. He's got a re rack here. Hope that he can get closer on the next, on the next lap. Maybe change his lineup through the final corner to get a better exit. But right now he's got more pressing things to worry about. Raymond Day's actually caught up to the back of him. Day is looking hungry for a spot. Day arts him out. Day moves up to the top five. Plus five for the 77. Will that last though? San Diego has crossed him up. The win on the outside. Going through Coca-Cola corner, backs it down. Raymond Day up to fifth and Negretti is gone. Coming up to the white flag this time. That's exactly what Justin wanted to see happen. That's exactly what Justin Negrete wanted to see happen. I got a spec to find out there's Justin in the booth, but 1.6 seconds back to Raymond and back to Kevin San Diego. But Raymond's got to be careful. I think that might actually be a slowdown area on the outside of that corner. If you go too wide and turn six, or it might just be a one X. So we'll see if Raymond Day does pull off to the side and serve a slowdown. 
No, I think that might have been a slowdown at one point and it might have been removed. But either way, he's going to get away with it. He's just going to have an extra incident point to his total. But Kevin San Diego is sticking way closer than he was able to to the back of Negrete. So the final corner, we'll see what Day can do. Day was better than San Diego the last time around. Kevin's still trying to run that narrow line, but he should be close enough today. He is definitely going to be close enough to have one more shot into turn one. Red flags waving me off for Waring. Waring's taking the final time around. San Diego looking to try and take back fifth. Day weaves all the way to the right side. Passes by Barney. Waves hello to him. San Diego waves to the left side of the track. Looking to leap up into the top five again. San Diego with the speed. Day with the braking. San Diego crosses him up. Holds him on by. Passes him on by. I said we had a textbook example in the F4 race of a switchback with Josh Conker. We just got another one in an F3 car. Well done, Kevin San Diego. Barbara Galanis disqualified. The 86 stopped to the side of the racetrack. Involved in the situation appears with him. Forced to tow it. Down to the final half lap as Waring ran away from Michael Kofrey during the second half of this race. The gap did dwindle to six, seven seconds. But Waring, able to pull off and away from the onset, broke away before the pit stops began. He'll break his way in the victory lane. Andrew Waring wins it at Fuji. It's completely dominant for Andrew. Just ran away after it looked like Michael Cofrey might have been able to give him a challenge. Did not work out for Michael in the grand scheme of things. And Andrew is going to put his stamp on this season, at least in race one. He's proven himself to be the toughest competitor in the field, at least on the long run at Fuji. Kevin San Diego is going to hang on to Raymond Day here as well. That was a great final lap for him. Raymond's not even going to have a chance coming to the line. As the finishers coming across overall tonight, of 22 cars. Check that 21 on the lead lap. We hang for the last amongst the top 10 what could have been if you were someone such as byron daly who charged the pack once able to get back to 17. take a look at some of the final battles on the racetrack this is richard swindell's amongst this grouping Two miles though this is four position for 19. Alex not to send it on Sanadakis through the final corner, though. He he might have been able to, but when, when you're fighting for 19th, you don't really make a move like that because he knows that he's going to have a run to the line. It's only for 19th place, but like I said, every point matters. Matthew Miles pulls to the inside. I think he's going to beat him to the line. Coming up to the mark. Not able to cut. Yes, he does, in fact, beat him up to the line by a couple one hundredths of a second, Joey. And Matthew Miles gets his revenge. He finishes ahead of James Carter, who spun in front of him. And I guess that's the that's the universe working itself out. Bar or Matthew Miles, rather, finishes ahead of the uh, the driver who took off his front wing. Justin Prince has been deputized to fill in elsewhere on race spot. So I'll be with you for the rest of the broadcast tonight. Andrew Waring wins at Fuji for his eighth win in PRL competition, his second in open wheel competition. Michael Cofrey still second despite falling back. And Alex Fournier, Kind of the loneliest man in Japan tonight finishes third. Justin Negrete wins the battle for fourth. San Diego and Raymond Day finish fifth and sixth. Ozzy Milwayne also kind of had a race of his own in seventh. And Takeshi Kita puts Atomic Racing in the top eight. Tyler Pierre Richards ended up ninth. And Joey Haynes was the only surviving evolved Sim Sport Apollo driver in tenth. Michael Broomhead finished 11th ahead of Ryan Miles. Oliver Le Olivier Lego, rather, ahead of John Quinn. James Doherty was 15th. Manuel Vargas, Byron Daly, Richard Swindells, Matthew Miles, Nico Sanitakis, James Carter, and Brad Miller were the last drivers on the lead lap. Matt Brewer went a lap down. Kwok Nin got taken out with one lap to go. Barbic Blada got disqualified. He will still finish 25th, I believe, and he might get no points from that with Piero Wilberg. I'm not sure. Marc-Andre LaRouche finished 26th, and then the used car for the back. Hurlitzki, Rob Campbell, Spencer Todd, Jake Potts, Lucio Vargas, James Malaire, Stephen Ritters, Juan Cofrey, Brandon Victil, Brian DeFries, Brett Thurman, Nick Horvath all ran into assorted amounts of trouble on the first couple laps or later in the race. And then uh, Kulaga, Martinez, and the other Kulaga did practice. They did qualify. They did not race tonight. But it looks like 
We've got our race winner ready for interview at the very least. Andrew Waring, race one back in F3, and you dominated it. Yeah, quite surprising. Um, everybody was seemed to be really close on pace uh, looking at the practice. Um, you know, we were kind of indecisive on where we are going to go with setup because uh, last time we drove this car, the track wasn't, uh, from what I understand, had a lot more grip. And then this latest update kind of took it away. So it was kind of a scramble to get a setup. And thankfully, we picked the right one. So it was a bit of a surprise in the end. So you kind of ran away from Kofre at the end there. But when you guys were fighting on the first couple laps, were you guys like deliberately working together and switching back? Or was that just the, the natural way things worked out? Um, I mean, when he passed me on the... the to, to end the first lap, I did like pet a little bit, a little bit to let him go because I mean, at that point, he's already passed me. Uh, I think it was uh, Fournier was about uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 behind. So to me, it just made a bit more sense to let him go because he's pretty obviously very quick and uh, see if we could get rid of that train. And thankfully, that worked out. But once uh, once I saw we were clear in the back, I, I kind of felt like I had more pace than him. So uh, I pushed on by. And uh, yeah, I was really surprised I was able to walk a little bit away from him at the start, to be honest. So there's nine more weeks to go. It's only week one, but you've certainly put your stamp at the, the top of the championship table right now. How are you feeling for the next nine weeks? About the tracks that are coming up, about the rest of the drivers in the field you've got to fight with? Are you thinking championship this early on? I mean, absolutely. Uh, a lot of the tracks um, coming up are really, uh, you know, some of my favorites, this one included. So the, the season's packed with... Uh, good calendar tracks the drivers i mean from i mean you can tell from qualifying i think it was you know there's 20 guys within three tenths it's it's pretty crazy so it's a long season but i mean after this i can't help but think you know of the big picture so all right before we let you go talk about those evolved sim sports guys we got to hear about them oh yeah i mean all five of us um we all kind of practiced together and worked together and pulled through at the end um so you know thanks to my teammates austin and spencer Aussie had a great result in p7 from p15 on the grid i think and then we had our uh, our other team apollo with joey haynes do quite well and some other unfortunate incidents with the other guys but you know we'll continue to work as a team and i think uh, already we've stamped uh, some pretty good marks on the fact that this team is uh, a threat for the team's championship as well so all right, well, we wish you good luck for the rest of the season, and I'm sure we will be talking to you multiple more times over the course of the next nine weeks. Thanks, guys. Andrew Waring, your winner tonight at Fuji, and I am so lonely here. It's just me and Hugo in the booth now. No other drivers want to talk to us tonight. Mike Cofrey, your podium hitter, Alex Fournier, nobody else in the field. I'll just tell you later, later on in the season, everybody can come talk to us. You don't have to be on the podium to talk to us, but next week we will be at Suzuka. September 29th, one week from today. Same time as always, 8.30. The F4 series will be back at the F4 series and the F3 series, rather. We'll be back. F4 at Suzuka, F3 at Okayama. So it's all Japan all the time on Thursday night next week. We look forward to seeing you then, and we look forward to seeing you five nights a week for Precision Racing League action. Next night of PRL action will be two days from now as we start week two. The NASCAR Cup Series will be back, and then... We'll be with you Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. But for now, from me, from Justin Prince, Hugo Luis, from every single driver and organizer in the Precision Racing League, we thank you for tuning in. And until next time, so long.